Welcome to See It and Feel It with Dr. Brett. And I'm Dr. Brett. And today I'm here with Christina Town, Thank you. former college soccer player. Yes as well as future podcaster. Yes. <laughs> and so part of the reason you're here today is to interview me. So mm -hmm. I'm turning it right over. Go. Okay, thank you. All Hi, right, everyone. Cool. Um, okay, well, I do know a little bit about you and I have okay. watched some of your podcasts um, on your website, Dr. Brett's Journey. Okay, cool. And um, nice. the first one I wanted to start with was more about like the mindfulness and meditation. Um, okay. If you had any suggestions for a new meditator, because I have been interested in meditating for the past two years. And every time I start, it lasts for about a week and I can't really just, tap in. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how do you meditate? What do you use? What tech? Because there's a lot of techniques in meditation. Um, I normally I try to concentrate on the on the breath because, okay. and on the out breath. Okay. Okay, because that's a simple one, the mm -hmm. paying attention to the in-breath, the out-breath, one or the other or both, and then when thoughts come, you come back to your focus, which is the breath. So in mm -hmm. other words, we're often distracted by thoughts or fantasies or whatever it is, and when we meditate, we come back to our focus. It could be a candle, it could be the breath, it could be a mantra. Do you know what a mantra mm -hmm. is? Just like yeah. OM, a vehicle to release the mind? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter the technique so much as it matters that you do it every day and stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, the breath's not working for you. Why do you think that is? Um, actually, the breath is working better for me. Um, it's more that I, it takes so long to get relaxed. And mm. so the way I do it is I focus on the out breath. And whenever a thought comes up, I label it as thinking and then I I go back to the breath. That was the method oh, okay. that I learned. Yeah, because maybe that that work of sort of labeling mm -hmm. might be, you know, I even use the word work. It might be like, you know, making it more difficult. Mm -hmm. I kind of like to make it really simple and just you notice that you're caught up in thoughts or fantasies or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then you're simply coming back. And again, it can be the in breath, the out breath, one or the other, or both. It could be both. Maybe that mm -hmm. makes it easier for you. Yeah. Um, but some some people are using apps like Headspace or Calm. Mm -hmm. So you could play with an app, or mm -hmm. you can even try a mantra like Om. You just sit and repeat a mantra over and over and over again, and eventually, what happens is you stay with it. It's hard work in the beginning, but when you stay with it, a lot of times the mind releases. Mm -hmm. I used to use. Um, uh, I took a course in TM, like Transcendental Meditation, mm -hmm. like 20, 30 years ago. And that's just a fancy way of giving you, from my perspective, a mantra, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you stick with that mantra, like I did it like pretty much every day for 20 to 40 minutes for probably two years before I had this extraordinary experience of total peace. Like I was in my basement at like one o'clock in the morning and I'm like an hour into this repeating this mantra and I got to this state of like what I would describe as like complete stillness mm -hmm. and I got so excited I popped out of yep. it and like mm -hmm. you know I'm not sure I ever got back there mm -hmm. um, but you can get there the metaphor is you can release the mind because the mind is so active right mm -hmm. and so if you're struggling to meditate that's just saying look you know 25 years old you know this is still really hard in the beginning for me, when I went through it, you know, in my late 20s, when I started meditating for real, I struggled for months. My body would just freak out on me. I had so mm -hmm. much resistance to just being still, right? Yeah. So what what's most important is you stay with it because mm -hmm. if you do, eventually, and maybe it takes a few months for you, it took a few months for me, yeah. you'll get past that. Mm -hmm. And once you get past that, then you'll start to actually enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then once you enjoy it, it won't be hard work anymore. Yeah. And again, maybe an app will help. I mm -hmm. mean, for some people it does. I also did years of meditation with a with a Buddhist that mm -hmm. taught me to meditate on the chakra points, the energy mm -hmm. centers. So we would listen to his Buddhist meditation music and then, you know, focus on either the heart chakra or third eye or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so over the years and decades, I've had experiences where you have like this funnel of energy coming through your crown chakra. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just sitting in this meditative state and you're, fo you're focusing your energy. It's like uh, in your mind's eye, mm -hmm. you're just bringing your focus onto the chakra center. 
for me, this third eye just sort of opens naturally. It's just something that is that occurs instantly because I'm decades in. Heart mm -hmm. chakra, if I wanna if I wanna feel super emotional, mm -hmm. you know, if, that, if you actually if you wanna feel more of that heart connection mm -hmm. with yourself and others, you can bring your focus into your heart. If you stay there in your focus for a period of time, it work it's real. Like it will light up this sort of energy center and then next thing you know you're like telling your wife or your parents how much you love them mm -hmm. or you know you're giving your money to strangers or whatever you do when you're more lit up by your heart space mm -hmm. so all of this is going to work it's in the beginning it's about playing with it and not giving in too much to the frustration right because mm -hmm. it's hard only for a while it might be hard for several months but several years later it'll be the, one of the best gifts you could ever give yourself Okay, so um, kind of, I don't know how this is going to fit into a question, but um, when mm. I was an athlete, I think that my meditation was like my morning workout because I know some people suggest you can meditate whenever you'd like. Other times they're like, oh, do it first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, so I used to be one of those athletes that I would wake up and that was the first thing I would do every day was like go for my mm. run and do my exercises. And I think that that functioned of my meditation, but mm -hmm. since I got injured, I'm no longer able mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. So I started like picking up yoga, but I'm having a lot of trouble like reconnecting with my body. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any suggestions of, I guess any techniques that someone who has had an injury um, could start implementing if they're not able to go back to their old routine that used to work for them. Yeah, well, the, the, the guy behind the camera is a huge um, yoga meditator as well. And, um, you know, yoga is very powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like, you know, I always have a yoga mat around, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not doing anything formal like I used to, but I spent my whole 20s with like pregnant moms, you know, doing yoga and verbs basically. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done, you know, thousands of yoga classes and then, you know, there's so much value in the experience of yoga that will connect you more to your mind, body, spirit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that, you can heal yourself from almost any injury, depending on the type of yoga you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge fan of that. You're already doing that one. Um, the, the meditation and the mindfulness practice, there's no substitute for, in mm -hmm. my opinion. You know, mindfulness is just simply paying attention to your thoughts, to your feelings and your body sensations mm -hmm. throughout the day, noticing when your mind is in the future or the past and coming back to the present. We're doing this. I was just telling a client this the other day. I just live this way, right? It's mm -hmm. not, it becomes part of your how you live. I'm almost always paying attention. There's something paying attention to my thoughts and my feelings and my yeah. body, right? Mm -hmm. There's some kind of consciousness that's observing, mm -hmm. right? It's hard to say what that is, God, source, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't even, no one can really prove what that mm -hmm. is. But that awareness, let's call it awareness, right? That awareness is just the best way to live because mm -hmm. the more you just, you know, practice mindfulness throughout your day, the more you're just gonna be intuitive and in touch and this thing that you're, you'll know your body better and better. It doesn't mean you always make the right choices. Sometimes, you know, you're having a pizza and a beer and you're knowing you're going to pay for that mm -hmm. even 20 minutes later. Right? I'm older than you, right? Yeah. For you two days later, for me, it's like, you know, that night I'm like, what did I do? Yeah. So it's not like, but like, you know, even when I'm doing it, you can feel it because you're more in tune because you're spending more time in this sort of sports psychology arena, right? Mm -hmm. Meditation mindfulness, visualization, breath work, you know, paying attention. Mm -hmm. The more you're in this arena, the more horsepower you have over time around self-awareness. And then you get a little more self-discipline too. Now, I'm not a organizational type, meaning mm -hmm. I use organization as a way of living effectively, mm -hmm. but I meditate intuitively, like yeah. randomly. I don't need a certain structure some people need that structure. Mm -hmm. Like maybe when you were in college and you were studying and an athlete, you needed that structure. Maybe now you don't need as much structure. You just do it intuitively. Yeah. If you're feeling, you know, one of the things I often say is if you're feeling either, you know, bored or tired or stressed, meditate. Yeah. Right. Or when in doubt, meditate. Like I'm just like, I think it's an amazing way to live. 
So the more you meditate, like the better here. I do this sort of bench press metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if you want, you know, giant pecs, so to speak, you gotta, you know, you're training yourself. And mm -hmm. as a meditator, the more you do it, you just get so much more comfortable. You actually love it. And you're not there yet. The guy loved meditating. Like I just look forward to it. My back almost always hurts and I'm okay with that because I yeah. actually love the experience so much. Yeah, I definitely, I think I do better with walking meditation because mm -hmm. I know that's an option too. Um, and it's easier for me to drop in. And I have heard for athletes that it might be better to do something active, a type of active meditation. How do you feel about that? Well, we, you know, I coach a lot of athletes and a lot mm -hmm. of them are sort of, you know, in this culture we live in now, there's just a lot of people with ADD. And so, right, mm -hmm. it's like, so a lot of times what we do is, you know, because some of them have talked to me about, you know, that they meditate through running or they, you know, meditate mm -hmm. through yoga or they meditate, you know, through walking or whatever it is. I'm kind of a fan of doing both, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so you actually have that formal practice. And so somebody that sort of has either a lot of energy or has a lot of ADD, they're really distracted. I like to, I like to have them work out hard first, yeah. then meditate. That definitely always yeah. worked better for me. Yeah. For and sure. so I think it sounds like for you right now, it's just really about, you know, moving through the resistance. I think mm -hmm. if you just kind of stayed with this for a couple weeks, not seven days. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're going to be on the other side of it. And mm -hmm. then once you're on the other side, it still comes and goes though. I mean, I go through days where, you know, I might meditate five or 10 minutes and then a days where I'll meditate for two or three hours. Like, so it really, there are times in the week where I'm going to meditate. I'll be up in the middle of the night and I'm just going to meditate a lot. I'm just stressed or there's a lot mm -hmm. going on. And so in the middle of the night, there's no, Distractions, distractions yeah. right? So 4 a.m. is an insane time to meditate, insane mm -hmm. in a good way, not in a bad way, right? It's like, I love that hour because the world is quiet around you. Mm -hmm. And the more sensitive you get, the more, I, what I say is you can feel the collective, right? Mm -hmm. So like when the market is open on a Monday and people are panicking because like something's going wrong in the world, mm -hmm. I can feel that collective, right? And so that makes that background noise is actually harder. And that market's not really open unless you're trading overseas or something. It's not really open till 930. And the panic doesn't really start till 830 pre-market. Yeah. So in other words, if you're up at four, you're going to be able to be more still. Yeah, you're going to have more time. Too. Yeah, more time, but also less of that sort of background noise mm -hmm. when everybody is around you is busy. Right. The world is busy mm -hmm. at 4 a.m. It's so stale. Mm -hmm. It makes so all these things are just thought, you know, food for thought to make it a little easier for you mm -hmm. in the beginning. So if you're up early and you're meditating, it's going to be easier. It just will be than during the day, most likely. Most okay. likely. Yeah. Everybody's a little individual about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So. OK, so then was that yeah. helpful. Yeah, it was very helpful. All right, cool. Um, the next question that I had for you is about anxiety in yeah. relationships, because I know a lot of people during this pandemic have been mm. locked at home, mm -hmm. um, me included, with people who are very triggering for them. and mm. Like maybe, parents and family members? Yeah. And not everybody wants to, you know, take responsibility for their roles in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And do you have anything that you could advise as far as how to maybe address or manage your anxiety when the other person isn't willing to take responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. What you just talked about in the beginning is, is a great sort of way to enter that question is mm -hmm. the more you exercise and the more you meditate, excuse me, the easier it is to handle mm -hmm. anyone, anybody. When I'm, my energy is high, when I'm feeling mm -hmm. good, I can pretty much handle like anybody, right? Yeah. All that like dra family drama, whatever it is, you know, because what you're talking about is very difficult when people do either blame or victimhood, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And they don't, or they're very defensive and they don't own their end of the equation and mm -hmm. then you're sort of trapped with them. Yeah. So what you're sharing is not easy, right? But if you're feeling good, right, you're making your life work regardless, mm -hmm. that's going to be probably the biggest buffer. Right. So you're exercise, you're meditating and you're getting creative in your own life. Creative, creative means that like, you know, you're with your boyfriend more or you're like talking to friends more mm -hmm. or you're if you're single, you are 
you know, internet dating or whatever that thing is. Maybe you're not meeting as many people in person, but you can still get creativity going even in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, I was talking to a client this morning and he's ran a lot of fear um, around COVID. And one of, the, one of the many arguments I've made is fear is not good for your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And when we teach ourselves in little microwaves, micro ways not to run fear like mm -hmm. you know when people mask up outside and get all scared and everything yeah. right that's fear and it's somewhat conformist as well because the, the 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 chances of outside transmission when you're passing a stranger i often playfully say is probably like getting hit by an asteroid right mm -hmm. it's, it's nearly impossible to give someone a virus by walking past them right just and so you see this fear response, and my client's been doing that. And I've invited him not to as a metaphor for living his whole life with less fear, mm -hmm. right? To have more courage not to do a behavior, even if it's a small behavior, it's sort of teaching your nervous system to be scared. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do now is use your parents right now as a training ground on mm -hmm. your nervous system to actually live a little bit differently, right? Mm -hmm. So you're now... Uh, you know, so when they trigger you, you're noticing these triggers and you're now you're growing in relationship, mm -hmm. which will help you with your boyfriend and your husband one day and whatever. And then your children as well, mm -hmm. because we're all being triggered often. Right. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how are we handling those triggers? Right. And a lot of times if we're tired, we're not handling them well. If we're stressed, we're not going to handle them well. If we're over caffeinated or hung over then we're definitely not handling them well. Mm -hmm. So all this is potential training ground for you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make it fun or easy, like, right? It's not. Yeah, it's, yeah, it is what it is. But you could actually look at it that way and go, mm -hmm. look, if I can make it through COVID with my parents, you know, even though they're dug in in different ways or whomever the family members are mm -hmm. or whoever the friends are, if I can make it through this, well, you know what I mean? Then there are many things I can make it through in life because it gets worse. I mean, it's just... If you live enough life, you just, you know, it gets hard, really hard at times, right? The traumas can get way worse than even whatever you're experiencing now. It just is, right? Mm -hmm. So again, you're getting yourself prepared to be more flexible and adaptive on your entire life's journey. Mm -hmm. And that's the real buffer for, you know, what separates people that handle like things like COVID well and people that don't, right, is flexibility and adaptability and the willingness to live with courage and not give in to fear and conformity because mm -hmm. that creates all kinds of other issues. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. Okay. Awesome. What else? All right. Another question that I have for <laughs> I like you this. is um, I know that you coach a lot of or you um, have relationships with a lot of professional athletes and high level executives. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what are like the top maybe three qualities that or characteristics that those people tend to have um, that someone like a younger person could try to embody if they're trying to become an entrepreneur yeah. or begin their life's journey? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, what are some of these traits of the of the super successful or more talented or more driven people? You know, some of these people you're talking about are very driven. Um, almost all successful people tend to persevere mm -hmm. and they tend to course correct really well. So in mm -hmm. other words, they're learning from their mistakes. Oh, sorry. They're not just, yeah, no worries. Um, they're not just automatically, you know, perseverance is a wonderful quality, but you have to understand what is a, a cul-de-sac, a dead end, mm -hmm. right? There are some people, some situations, some relationships that are dead ends, right? Some jobs and some opportunities yeah. are dead ends. So what really successful people are doing is learning to recognize sooner mm -hmm. and then having the courage to take action around situations in their life. So in other words, okay. if they're much less likely to stay stuck. They're going to yeah. be more flexible and more adaptive mm -hmm. and they're going to have those and then they're going to persevere, right? And go through rough times really well, but they're also going to know when to course correct, when to call it quits, mm -hmm. right? That's really, really important. So flexibility, adaptability, creativity is another really mm -hmm. good quality because people that are creative, they find other ways. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I was saying also this morning was, as hard as this year was, because I went through this 
really intense, like, you know, severe fracture of my wrist and everything. It was a tremendous amount of pain. It was just like incredibly uncomfortable. And then COVID in the beginning was so difficult because my client base was freaking out mm -hmm. and I was just holding up so many human beings. And then I was shorting the market when I never had any experience doing that. Mm -hmm. Like just I knew was the right thing to do. Um, so it was just an incredibly stressful year as it has been all for all of us in a lot of ways. But it's also one of the best years of my entire life by far. And, it, and I feel like having lived in China and lived in Thailand and lived all through the United States and, you know, gone through a lot of suffering and a lot of sort of things happening has sort of set me up for that mm -hmm. success in 2020, even though it was a difficult year. It's been very difficult, obviously, for everybody, right? But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you can't thrive in difficulty, but you've got to be set up for that, mm -hmm. right? The willingness to not do fear because everybody else is doing fear, right? Mm -hmm. Or not follow the herd just because everybody else is following the herd. You know, there's this expression in the stock market that, you know, that like when there's blood in the streets and you notice that it's your blood as well, mm -hmm. that's the time when you got to buy, mm -hmm. right? When everybody else is panicking, most of the time that's when it's an opportunity to buy. Mm -hmm. And there's no way you can do that if you're just running fear. Yeah. So one of the things that I live and teach is to like, you know, learn how to do less and less fear everywhere in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's just not easy, especially depending on how we're raised. Oh yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So anxiety is often this sort of projection, right? That some negative event will occur in the future. What if? So if you still have what if thinking, I have almost no what if thinking left other than, you know, mostly positive what if thinking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I'm overtired, the mind will do that what if thing, mm -hmm. right? Because I, you know, I've had a lot of trauma, so it's there, the what if. But I don't give what if thinking in a negative way any real energy because mm -hmm. all it does is lead to anxiety or fear or depression, right? Mm -hmm. So training yourself not to do what if. What if this relationship I'm in doesn't work out or what if he cheats on me or what if I get cancer or whatever it is instead you live more and more present more and more creative more and more flexible more and more adaptive and then you're able to handle it and at some point we're all going to have to let go I was just at my mm -hmm. next door neighbors right he's 87 years old and he's going to have to let go you know soon right not just of his life, but his circumstances and so on. He's probably going to move, and you know, because he's 87 and living alone. Yeah. His wife of 60 years just died in February before, yeah. not of COVID, but she died. 60-year yeah. partnership. So every time I go over there, not every time, but every other time or something, he kind of like opens up to me and it's sad. Yeah. Like we're both sad because yet letting go is tough. Yeah. So these people around you that are sort of really stressful, it's hard when you have to live with them or whatever, mm -hmm. but you can also have some perspective that they're not always going to be there. That mm -hmm. might help too, recognizing yeah. that, you know, at some point they're not going to be with you. Yeah. So maybe we can sort of, you know, address that. And then the communication piece, I think most um, really successful people are, people are really good communicators. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying successful financially, right? It's way beyond, because in our culture, we live in a culture that talks often about success being, it equals financial. Mm -hmm. And in my world, success is emotional, spiritual, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, not mm -hmm. just, right? Um, but again, coming back to anxiety, not projecting. And we're going to come to this in a sec. Thanks for watching See It and Feel It with Dr. Brett. And stay tuned for part two of this interview. Remember to like, subscribe, and share with a friend.